The purpose of this morning's meeting is to resume our pre-legislative scrutiny of the general scheme of the Assisted Human Reproduction Bill 2017. We will hear a presentation today from the LGBT Ireland. Uh, we had invited the Iona Institute to this session as well, but since they had presented via Dr. Rosanna Rose at our meeting on the 19th of December, they did not propose to add to their testimony. So on behalf of the committee, I would like to welcome Dr. Sorry, well, Dr. Lydia Bracken, a legal advisor, and Ms. Paula Fagan, Chief Executive of LGBT Ireland. I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in relation to the ev their evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I also wish to advise you that any opening statements you have made to the committee may be published on the committee's website after this meeting. Members are reminded of their uh, long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person or persons outside the houses or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Can I now ask uh, Ms Paula Fagan to make your opening statement? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson and Committee Members. I'd like to first uh, thank you for inviting LGBT Ireland uh, to attend your meeting today. I'm joined, as you said, by our legal advisor, Dr Lydia Bracken, who authored our recent submission, and we'll split our opening statement time between us. Uh, our aim today is to give the Committee an understanding of the specific challenges facing same-sex parents and their children in the absence of a clear legislative framework in Ireland in relation to donor-assisted human reproduction and surrogacy. By way of introduction, I should explain that LGBT Ireland is a national charitable organisation which provides support and advocacy services to lesbian, gay, bi and transgender people and their family members. And we provide this through a confidential helpline service as well as face-to-face -face supports through our peer support groups. The issues raised through our frontline services informs our advocacy work and in 2017 calls and emails requesting information on parenting rights was the most frequent advocacy inquiry to our organisation. This led us to hold a series of public meetings and events in Dublin, Cork and Galway in 2018 where we met with hundreds of families and same-sex same couples planning parenthood and it's their experiences that inform our submission and input to you today. The proposals we put forward are based on protecting the best interests of the child and are informed by reference of the rights of the child under the, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, the European Convention on Human Rights and Articles 42 of the Irish Constitution. It is argued that the best interests of the child are met through laws that recognise the reality of life for the child and that ensure the child can be fully cared for by the adults whom he or she regards as parents. For children raised in families headed by same-sex parents, this means that they should have an opportunity of acquiring a legal relationship with both intended parents, and those parents should have all the legal tools necessary to care for their children. The reality is for children being raised in same-sex parents in Ireland today is that they have no way of establishing legal parental relationship to both of the parents who care for them, and this disproportionately affects donor-conceived children with same-sex parents as their relationship to both par parents is often questioned, causing, cons cause causing considerable stress and uncertainty for these families. This is particularly so where medical consent is required or when obtaining legal documents such as passports, but it also arises in everyday situations like, for example, providing consent for school trips. Several families we spoke to have children with serious health conditions that require ongoing medical attention and for these families, the stress is caused by the lack of legal rights puts a huge additional strain upon them. While we acknowledge this is a complex piece of legislation and we support the thorough examination of all the issues involved, we ask that you progress your deliberations urgently. 
Uh, this is a time-sensitive issue. Um, families and couples planning parenthood cannot wait indefinitely. The lack of clear regulations leaves couples making decisions about donor-assisted re human reproduction pathways based on what they think and what, what they guess the legislation will be, which may have far-reaching implications for their future family life. As each day passes, the number of families living in legal limbo is increasing, and this will only continue until the legislation in this area is fully commenced and widely communicated. It is imperative that this proposed legislation includes retrospective provisions to cover the families that already exist. And I'll hand you over to Dr. Bracken to go to her for the submission. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Paula. Um, thank you to the Chair and Committee members for inviting us to attend today's hearing. Um, our submission concentrates on the proposed regulation of surrogacy as set out in the AHR Bill. Uh, with a particular focus on how the proposed regulation would affect male couples who have already become parents through surrogacy and those who may seek to do so in the future. In our view, the proposed regulation of surrogacy, as set out in the AHR Bill, would not adequately protect the best interests of children born through surrogacy, and so amendments are required. A major issue that we see in the proposed regulation is that there is no provision in the Bill to recognise children who have already been born through surrogacy. For male couples, this means that there is no facility to retrospectively recognise both men as legal parents of their child. The only option would be for the couple to apply for a second parent adoption, which we do not believe to be an adequate solution. By contrast, where a child has been born through donor-assisted human reproduction, or DAHR, once parts 2 and 3 of the Children and Family Relationships Act 2015 are commenced, intended parents will be able to retrospectively apply to be jointly recognised as legal parents, and we argue that a similar process should be put in place for surrogacy. International surrogacy is currently excluded from the AHR Bill, meaning that the Bill will only apply to domestic arrangements. This is problematic because the exclusion of international surrogacy from the bill will not prevent couples from accessing services abroad. It simply creates significant difficulties for the family when they return to Ireland with their child. The child has no control over the circumstances of conception and so should not be disadvantaged by virtue of the fact that he or she was conceived through surrogacy abroad. And we argue that it is in the best interest of the child for his or her relationship with the intended parents to be legally recognised in Ireland following the international surrogacy arrangement. We also believe that the model of parentage that is proposed in the bill, whereby the surrogate is recognised as the legal mother at birth and parentage is later transferred to the intended parents by way of a parental order, is inappropriate. A major difficulty that arises with this delayed or post-birth model of parentage is that at the time of the child's birth, the non-genetic father is not recognised as a legal parent and cannot be recognised until the time that the parental order is granted. The application for the parental order cannot be made earlier than six weeks and not more than six months after the child's birth. This approach, we believe, leaves the child in a vulnerable position as he or she is cared for from birth by the intended parents, one of whom will not have any legal parental responsibility or decision-making powers for at least six weeks. Instead, the surrogate, as the legal mother, retains decision-making responsibility for the child until the time that the parental order is granted. We argue that a preconception model of parentage would better protect the rights of all stakeholders in the surrogacy process. Preconception court orders would provide approval of the surrogacy arrangement and determine the parentage of the child before conception takes place. This would ensure that both of the intended parents have full legal powers to care for the child and ensure that the child is legally integrated into his or her family from the moment of birth. Certain additional issues relating to assisted human reproduction are of particular concern to LGBT Ireland members, such as non-clinical DAHR procedures and international DAHR. While we acknowledge that these issues are not addressed in the AHR Bill and are perhaps outside of the scope of today's hearing, we believe that they are in need of attention, and so the Bill could be used as a way to amend the Children and Family Relationships Act 2015 <coughs> to ensure that it accommodates the widest range of families possible. These areas and our recommendations for reform are discussed in detail in our submission and we're happy to speak to them today should any member wish to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr Bracken. Uh, Deputy O'Reilly. Well, okay. Thank you. Um, thanks very much and I, and I do want to apologise because I know that we, we did keep you waiting and we just had slightly more matters than, than, uh, than we would usually have this morning. So 
I thank you for your patience. And uh, I have a few questions, and, uh, and, and we, we might get a chance for another round later, because I think this is something that you know, we, we do need to, to tease out. So in your submission, you refer to issues around uh, a second parent adoption. So it's on page two of your, your submission. Uh, we said the only option is for the couple to apply for a second parent adoption, which we don't believe to be an adequate solution. You might outline for us what the difficulties with, a, apart from the obvious, you know, two, two, sort of two levels of parent, which you know, is, is, not, is not going to work, but you, you might outline for us what the specific difficulties that, that, that you would see with regard to that. Because I know that there are some people who would say, well, look, that's, that's a solution. It's not ideal, but it might just work. But actually, my read of this is that there, that could create more problems than it actually fixes. So you might outline for us what, what your views are in that regard, um, yeah, if I can. Yeah. That question. Um, so, in terms of how second parent adoption operates under the Adoption Amendment Act uh, 2017, um, it stipulates that in order for the partner of a parent, whether it's the spouse or a cohabiting partner, to engage in second parent adoption, they have to care for the child for two years um, in order to become eligible. So, you have there's a two year waiting period in order for second parent adoption to become an option. First of all, um, where the waiting period has not been met and they've been caring for the child for less than two years, so for example, if the child is under the age of two, um, a full joint adoption would be required. In a full joint adoption, you as a birth parent would need to give up your existing legal rights and then jointly adopt with your partner or your spouse. So that is changing the child's status in relation to the biological parent first of all. I think it's an unnecessarily complicated situation. So that is kind of the main legal reason at least as to why second parent adoption simply is not a viable solution to be used in cases of DAH or surrogacy. And, and just to add to that, we did, I, we submitted to the committee, I suppose, another point to make around the, the, the urgency around this legislation is that the Adoption Authority of Ireland aren't processing step-parent adoption where there's any donor-assisted um, element to it. So they're, they're waiting for this, this legislation to be in place. So that isn't effectively available to people now anyway. Yeah. Um, but also, I suppose, as Lydia's outlined, we don't see that, particularly from the child's point of view, I mean, I think children understand adoption. They know other children in their class or their families that are adopted. So they understand, I suppose, on a, an emotional level what that means. And it's very different, say, to a child who's born into a family with, where the parents intended to have them and have always been there, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. And, and it is, uh, as you said, and I thank you for outlining that because I think we, we need to what might seem on the surface to be uh, oh, that, that ticks that box covers up actually will create uh, will create more problems and and also uh, will create difficulties for the child because that's that's got to be clearly our focus um with regard to international best practice so you know that could probably save us like a massive amount of work if we just look to an, another jurisdiction where they have managed uh, to, to do this and to do it right. So you, you might uh, outline for us, if you could, where you see, you know, I mean, where we could go to copy someone's homework, really, um, where we could go to, to get it right. Um, yeah, so in terms of I suppose, our, our submission, we have made reference to the preconception um, approach, and I believe that was mentioned at the last committee hearing as well. Um, that type of approach is used in a number of jurisdictions around the world. Um, I think New Hampshire was mentioned as a model of a very good practice um, in the last committee hearing. My own academic research has looked at the South African model, and I believe that both of those models are very appropriate. They are both based on preconception court orders, where you would go to court before the conception of the child has ever taken place. You would, within that um, court process, gain authorization to engage in the surrogacy, but then also um, parentage would be allocated at the outset. So everyone is certain at the outset who the parents are once the child is born, and it means that when your baby is born, you're not, you know, you can focus on caring for your, your newborn. You're not going to court again to you know, fix legal parentage issues. So those are two jurisdictions that I think are very good models of surrogacy um, and they would provide, I think, appropriate blueprints perhaps for Ireland to look to when regulating. Yes. And that's actually a very interesting point because you're, you're facing into uh, a legal battle 
at the time in your life when you're up in the middle of the night. Yeah. <laughs> it's the last time when you want to, you know, when, when you're just barely functioning, the last thing you want to yeah. do is have to dig out your, your work clothes and make your way to court. Um, one, of the, one of the issues that was raised, and it was discussed here previously, and I know this, that, that it's discussed uh, outside of here, is with regard to surrogacy, you know, very valid issues have been raised uh, around the potential to coerce women, um, particularly vulnerable women, women from um, disadvantaged backgrounds, and, and you know. So you might speak a, a little bit, if you could, about how we can, uh, as legislators, put those protections in place, because nobody in in this room, I know, or outside this room, wants to stand over or be responsible for a situation whereby mm. we uh, mm. you know gi give some sort of consent or assent to uh, to to the coercion of vulnerable mm. women outside mm. or even within this state so y you might just talk us through how legally we could give those protections because nobody wants that yeah. nobody wants that to be uh, an unintended consequence mm. thank you um, so in terms of I suppose, protecting women, I think that's a very important point along with protecting the best interests of the child. And to do both, I think it's important first of all that we focus on an altruistic model of surrogacy. So rather than engaging in a commercial surrogacy regime which poses the risk of you know, perhaps financial incentives for someone to act as a surrogate and then skewing any informed consent that might be provided, if we focus on an altruistic model it ensures that you know, they're not being distracted by other financial issues going into the arrangement first day. Um, in addition to that, I think it's important that surrogates are provided with appropriate counselling in advance so they understand their role um, and they're not being coerced into it, and also that they're provided with independent legal advice. So that will ensure that they have made an informed choice to become a surrogate and they understand the legal implications um, as well as the suppose, social implications of their role as a surrogate. So by putting those safeguards in place, we can protect both women who act as surrogates and um, the children and also protect intended parents as well. So I think those safeguards can be legislated for. Are there other jurisdictions where those safeguards have been legislated for? Again, can we, can we replicate good practice that we talk, going back to New Hampshire and South Africa in terms of looking to, to those jurisdictions? Yeah, as far guidance? as I'm aware, they both have um, systems in place, so they both only allow altruistic surrogacy to begin with, and then also there is provisions around counselling and independent legal advice for surrogates as well. So I think they, we could draw on those other jurisdictions to find a model of best practice to ensure the coercion doesn't occur. Excellent. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy O'Reilly. Um, Deputy Donnelly. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you both for, uh, for coming in and for your, uh, your ongoing work on this and for your submission. Um, can I ask in terms of the, the parental switch, um, if there are any concerns in terms of a lack of rights for um, for the surrogate, so for the, for, the, for the woman bearing the child. Obviously, we've just had a, a, a big referendum on, um, on bodily autonomy for women. Are there any issues, if I understand your, your proposal correctly, it's that at some point during the pregnancy, or maybe before the pregnancy, whatever, but at, at some point before birth, there is a court order put in place uh, that says that the, the, the parents um, or the, at birth, at the moment of birth, the, 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 the two parents, neither of whom is bearing the child, are the legal parents of the child. Um, the, the corollary, obviously, is that the woman giving birth, the woman bearing the child, l loses any of those rights and is losing them ahead of time. Are there any issues um, in terms of the woman bearing the child and her bodily autonomy during the pregnancy, and are there any issues whereby um, a woman may give birth and change her mind, or want to change her mind? How, how are though, in terms of giving up the child, how, how are those two issues uh, considered within this idea of court orders being in place ahead of birth? The, the models of preconception um, arrangements that exist around the world, um, most jurisdictions would stipulate that 
the surrogate, the woman giving birth to the child, takes all healthcare decisions. So if there is any issue that arises during the pregnancy, it would be for the surrogate to determine. So she maintains her own bodily integrity in that way. Um, in terms of a surrogate wanting to change her mind, um, I think it's important to note that the research that exists, and I, I do preface that by saying that I'm a legal academic as opposed to someone with specialist knowledge in sociology or psychology, but the research that I have read and I'm aware of shows that it's very unusual that a surrogate would want to change her mind. Um, I think in the last committee hearing a figure of maybe 4% was raised. Um, I'm not sure of, of the origins of that figure, but from my own research, I think from the UK, there have been three reported cases in the past 20 or 30 years where a surrogate has refused to um, hand over the child, and so that, that case has gone to court. Of course, there can be other cases or other issues that don't make it to court or other you know, problems arising, but you know, three um, I suppose difficult cases out of probably hundreds of successful surrogacies indicates that it's very unusual that the surrogate would want to change her mind. And would you, would you like to see any clauses added if the legislation was amended that would provide provide some mechanism in those situations? Or is it, abroad is it the case that when the court order is in place, that's, that's that? Um, I think you do need to I suppose, legislate for all circumstances, but I suppose that's a matter for the legislature to determine whether yeah. you know, the, the very small chance of someone changing their mind, that, that needs to be included in the legislation. However, there could be a situation whereby a court application could be made but to be determined based on the best interests of the child. So that needs to be our paramount focus in any legislation. Um, and so the court would then determine, well, what is best for this child uh, yeah. in this situation? OK. So you could have some sort of emergency clause or review clause or something. Be, yeah. OK. Thank you. Um, the, the point you raise, I think, is very interesting around there's, there's this existing, uh, and as the bill is drafted, there will continue to be a, an issue for retrospective for, for kids, kids who are born now. Yeah. Um, and as I understand it, the, the issue is for children born via donor-assisted reproduction, but not through surrogacy. Yeah. Would you just talk us through an example for each of those and, and, and what the problem is procedurally in one and, and how it's not a problem in the other? So can you, are you talking about the, if someone has already had a child yeah. through DAH or yeah. through surrogacy? Yeah. So currently if you have had a child through DAH or, um, once parts two and three of the Children Family Relationships Act 2015 are commenced, you, uh, there will be a, a section in the bill, sec or, or section um, 20 of the Act, I should say, mm -hmm. sections 21 and 22 as well, which will allow for a retrospective application to be made. So you can go to court for um, you and your partner to be recognised as the legal parents of that child. There is no equivalent provision in the AHR bill. So for a couple... Sorry, in the, in the what? In the AHR bill, yeah. so in, the, in the current bill that yeah. we're discussing. So if a child has already been born through surrogacy, there is no equivalent process where you could go to court and have both intending parents recognised as legal parents. So that's why in, in my opening submission I mentioned that really second parent adoption, although it's, it's not actually allowed mm -hmm. at the moment, um, but potentially um, that would be the only solution. Or okay. you could apply for guardianship of the child um, if you are not currently recognised as an intended parent. We do not have provision within the bill to retrospectively recognise parentage. So we argue that a similar process to that which applies in cases of DAHR mm. should be allowed for cases of surrogacy. It would create parity in our legislation and it would recognise the fact that a number of children have been born through surrogacy in the past number of years. Mm. Um, a survey was released I think last year or the year before which indicates that Ireland is currently the second highest user of surrogacy in the world. So we have a lot of children who have been born through surrogacy who need their family relationships to be regularised and one way to do that is to include provisions in the AHR bill that allow for retrospective parentage. And is it a, is it a straightforward gender issue? Is it essentially a case that if you have uh, two women, one of them gives, gives birth, mm -hmm. she is uh, one of the parents and then her partner, uh, be they civil partner or whatever, yeah. can under the current law, will be able to apply to be uh, the second parent. But for two men, the man who, the, the parent who might be a donor, can say, so, yeah, you, you are, but his partner can't. Is that essentially the, the yeah. issue? So I suppose 
No, it's, uh, okay. it's quite complex. So I'll take you through, I suppose I'll point to the parts in the submission. So basically at the moment, some female couples are covered under the Children and Family Relationships Act. Yeah. And that's a certain, certain, I suppose, parameters around that. So they, they, it has to be an unidentifiable donor that they used it. Retrospectively, they can have access services abroad, prospectively only in Ireland. Um, and so there's variation. So a lot of female couples are now finding out that they're not covered under the Children and Family Relationships Act. So we're proposing in our submission that the, this... And, and sorry, why, why are they not covered? So for example, maybe they, in the, they have used a known donor, so someone, a friend or a family member yeah. of their, the, the one partner, the non-birth partner, yeah. has donated sperm effectively yeah. for female couples and yeah. then, so they're not covered under the provisions of the Children and Family Relationships Act because the donor is known. Do you know why that's the case? Was there a rationale put forward to, for known versus unknown at the time? I think it's around, I, I'll hand over to my legal colleague on this because I, it's around uh, the case law. Um, well I suppose where a known donor has been used and so prior to the, the laws coming into place, was technically speaking he is the legal father. Yeah. So it's more difficult I suppose to transfer rights then from the okay. existing legal father to the intended parents. Um, it can certainly happen, I think, through a, a post-conception consent model, yeah. um, which we have proposed in our submission, but I d I'm not aware of the exact policy reasons as to why it wasn't included, but I think that is probably a good indication of why. Okay. So I think the important thing really is around the, con the trail of consent, if you like, and I suppose a lot of families would have good relationships with relationships with their known donor in the yeah. sense that they would consent <coughs> to both of the parents, both of the female mm. parents being the legal parents. Yeah. So that consent issue is, is sorted out, yeah. but there is no process, it's not allowed for, there's no regulations to allow the, then the second female parent to register. They're just not provided for. If the donor is known. If the no donor is known, yes. And will the current bill as drafted address any of that? Or are these additional issues this we should be... Will know. No, this, okay. So, so we need to be looking at amending the, 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 the existing act as well. Exactly. To broaden that out. Okay. Okay, so it's an issue for, uh, for two women if the donor is known. Yeah. And is it an issue for two men in every circumstance? Pretty much. I mean, the way okay. same-sex male couples are accessing the parental pathways that they use primarily is surrogacy yeah. or in terms of adoption, but adoption isn't really open in Ireland at the moment. Okay. Um, I mean, this, in terms of a same-sex couple can apply jointly, jointly to be assessed for adoption, mm. but then there's very few countries open to same-sex couples. Yeah. So while they may be able, in theory, to access international adoptions, that's not practically a possibility, okay. really, apart from South Africa. So I suppose the legislation, what, I, what we're seeing in terms of a consultation with families are that in terms of females, couples, because I suppose donor-assisted human reproduction has advanced even since the Children mm. and Family Relationships Act was um, enacted, mm. people are accessing services abroad because there's more advanced technology abroad, if you like, there's mm. more options for people who have fertility issues, because same-sex couples have fertility issues too, sure. as well as needing donor assistance. Yeah. So I suppose that's our main concerns, is that we, we think the Children and Family Relationships Act, while it is fantastic for the families that it covers, there are many families left behind, and we think that this, as the second pillar in, in regulating assisted human reproduction, has to look at those issues, yeah. and has to try and address those, because the children exist and they yeah. need their parents recognised. Yeah. So we have, I suppose, in, in terms of the submission across parts, pages three to, to five and six, we've covered yeah. what we see as a framework to do that. Yeah. And basically it relies on the parents being able to establish consent with their donor or to have a, a, a court process where they can show that the child will, ha will have their right to identity protected. So that we see that as absolutely should be enshrined in the law, yeah. but there are ways then of, the, of parents through the, the regulations and through the donor conception um, register around recording that information, if that okay. makes sense. Yeah, that's great. Thank you yeah. very much. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Deputy Donnelly. Uh, Deputy Murphy. Thank you, um, Chair, and welcome, ladies, and sorry again for keeping you waiting. You're, you're very patient. 
Um, can I just ask you, please, you're saying about holding the uh, public meetings around the country. Were either of you at? at uh, yeah. Um, I presume, like the geographical spread, the, the same issues came up in, in each of the three, yeah. the three places. Like there was no. Do you yes. know, sometimes we down in Cork have a different yes. way of thinking, or you know, it's a bit of a, it's a nicer world maybe, but uh, yeah, but <laughs> yes, much better. We're the much superior. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but like obviously the issues across the board here were were probably very much in common, were they? Very much in common. Yeah, yeah. I think potentially some people had slightly easier time in terms of registering their child. They can't obviously same-sex couples can't be registered at the moment. Both parents on the birth cert. That still hasn't been commenced yet, but potentially going into, say, for example, the um, Lombard Street to register the birth, potentially the double barrel surname was, was able to be used, whereas, say, down the country, for example, registrars weren't used to that or whatever. Okay. So there was certain elements of, but I think generally speaking, there's a huge lack of information. So once a, a same-sex couple engages with any state service, there really is... Um, they're meeting with a lot of barriers. I suppose this, the civil servants, if you like, aren't equipped okay. or don't have the knowledge really to to deal with them. And that's that right. can be very difficult because I suppose we were speaking to a family the other day and they were saying like a, you know, they went in to register their child and obviously they couldn't register even though they're a married couple. Yes. Um, and then they were watching a, a, a an opposite sex couple who had quite a complex, I can't remember the details, but they were able, the registrar was able to work with them and get the, the right. both parents registered. Okay. So I suppose we see a situation in post-marriage equality where couples, same-sex couples actually believe, they don't know a lot of this detail either. Right. So they're going ahead and having children. Yes. Clinics are open to them. <coughs> and they find this out retrospectively. So okay. that's a real issue. And I suppose the work we're trying to do is really to inform people that yes. there isn't regulations in place yet yeah but countrywide I think there isn't much difference in the experience okay yeah and I suppose it is important to get what should be a very special time of registering your child um, so maybe there should be training yes yeah. for staff you know and because uh, it it is a very very special time for all couples obviously yes. you know um, and in your experience the, the surrogacy person themselves are they happy with your proposal so the you know, of the surrogate mother. Uh, yes, yeah. So like, yeah. have you come across any problems with, you In know, terms of the proposed laws, is yes. it? Yes, yeah. Um, well, I, th I think, for, I suppose, our, our, our greatest kind of information probably comes from the UK, where they're currently in the process of amending their, or considering to amend their own legislation. So the English Law Commission is looking at the UK regulation. Um, currently, the UK regulation is based on a delayed or post-birth model, but a number of people have found that... Um, to be, it was inconsistent with the reality of surrogacy, um, and they don't feel that it's working well. So, a, a survey published by Surrogacy UK, um, in which a number of surrogates were, um, were were surveyed, they responded that they did not believe that the the current UK model was again fit for purpose, and they felt, in their view, the majority who responded that the intended parents should be the legal parents from the moment of birth. So, I think that reflects what we have proposed in our submission that it should be a preconception model. Surrogates in general from the research, um, again, you know, it, it is sociological and psychological research, but it shows generally they don't see the child as their own. Um, they understand that they are, you know, doing this great gift for another um, individual or another, another couple, but they don't suppose, bond in, with the child in the same way that, you know, another mother might. Okay. Um, they understand that it's, it's someone else's child and, yes. and they're happy with that arrangement, yes. Okay. Okay. And I suppose just to add to that, I suppose the families that we have met who have used surrogacy, any families that I've met, it's, it's, it's all uh, male couples, would have a, quite a strong relationship with the woman who acted as a surrogate, right. as it happens. I've yeah. seen that. And Which is I, nice. Yes, and I think that, I think a lot of people, couples who use donor conception will have a huge, um, I suppose, what would you say, you know, we read, I've Closest donor conceived public. children, so I know that process in your head that you go through where you think, how will we protect the child's yes. best interests? So yes. you, ha you have that thought before you ever do. Yeah, so the child is the centre. Yeah. So I suppose I see people. that in the couples we're meeting now, is that they have maintained a relationship so that the child can have that face and that, yes. some sort of relationship. Yeah. So I think 
that's the reality, what we've seen anyway, in yeah. terms of the couples we've met, that is a genuine reality. And, and I know one couple who have, um, we mentioned in submission, who have a child who's very ill, um, they would, the, surrogate, the woman who acts as surrogate would have a co pretty much a lot of contact. Right. And yeah. so that's which is nice too if, if yeah. everyone is happy. Which so is just to share that with you because I yeah. suppose it's the real stories as well that help. Yeah, I suppose we it. forget that behind all these figures and talking about it are, are people you know, yeah. and people's lives. And just one more when you were saying there about um, provisions to cover families that already exist. So they're obviously very much on board. People who have gone through it, <coughs> through the whole system, and like there's oh. no problems coming from any. Anyone no, I mean, the only that problems way. that are arising are the lack of a legal okay. pathway to get recognition. So yeah. it's very, I suppose it's very practical stuff a lot of the time that people ring us about, like how can, is this true we can't get, is it true we can't apply for passports? For example, a lot of couples now are going in, so they're married couples now, so we have couples going in to, to get a passport and they have had their child, they've planned the child together, they've had the child together. Yeah. And now they're going in to get a passport for the child and they have to sign an affidavit. Whoever is the birth parent yes. is forced to sign an affidavit saying they're a lone parent. Oh, yeah. And that is very difficult. And people are constantly ringing us saying, this can't be right. So we're actually effectively being for Like they're honestly putting forward all their documentation. Yes, but thinking this, that it would be straightforward. But the state are saying to them, no, no, you have to sign this. If you want a passport, you have to sign. Yeah, and it's cruel. So you know? it is, a, it, it's a real dilemma for people and yes, yes so that's where it comes up so no nobody is coming to us saying they're regretting that they had they used the donor conception if you know yeah what I mean. yeah no not necessarily that but i suppose do they feel hard done by that new parents that it could be sorted for them and it, it well, was see what you mean um yeah. i don't think so i think i think Prospectively, I think the difference is that at least people will be clear, so they'll be making decisions in an informed way. That yeah. they know. I think what happens at the moment, and even with the Children and Family Relationships Act, because it's not fully commenced, people are still somewhat in the dark. Yes. So they're making decisions. We met a family the other day who are trying to decide, will we go to England or will we stay here? You know, and they're making those decisions around having their second child trying to preempt what the legislation is going to be. Yes, yeah. So it's a hard place to be. Yeah. So I think that's really the biggest issue. So prospectively while there people have some concerns which may not be addressed, which may you may feel that you have to have a narrower definition. Yes. But at least they'll know that before yes. they, they start. Before it. they decide. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you, Chair. Uh, Deputy Murphy, thank you. Now um, Deputy Durkin are you happy to allow Senator, Senator Warfield to come in now, or would you prefer to come in yourself first? I'm myself now because okay. I, have to, I have to leave anyway. Yes, I'm sorry okay. about that. Thank you. Uh, um, just very quickly, I want to thank our witnesses for coming before the committee this morning. And um, <coughs> uh, that we've, 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 we've done our best to read ourselves up to date in relation to this very complicated but very important subject. And uh, my question would be uh, first of all, we all know uh, uh, aspiring parents, people who, who wish to have children, and for all of the reasons that we got into before cannot and the m most important thing following that I think is that we are assured uh, as to the legal uh, foundations on which the legislation is, is now going to be built and the extent of the legislation. Are you satisfied from your own uh, involvement uh, so far uh, that we, you know that we can we can establish uh, the best practice here in or in line with best practice elsewhere, and that uh, from a legal uh, point of view that uh, we can be rest reasonably well assured that the legal challenges uh, will not turn the legislation on its head. Benefits of being so late to the day in terms of legislating is that we have the benefit of looking at what other countries have done. So, from that, 
it makes it, it was easier to identify best practice. So looking around the world, we can pick, I think, bits, advantageous parts of other people's legislation to create a really solid foundation for our own regulation. I think it's possible, and um, the proposals that we have put forward in our submission, I think, would create a more coherent um, structure for surrogacy in Ireland, and it would better balance the rights of all stakeholders in the process. It's very important to remember that there are a number of stakeholders involved, and all of their rights and interests need to be balanced against one another. So I think looking at what has been done in other jurisdictions helps with that, and it allows us to build um, coherent legislation in that way. And uh, all the stakeholders obviously includes, uh, includes the, the baby, uh, the, the, the donor, uh, the surrogate mother. Mm -hmm. And um, to what extent on the basis of court cases already taking place in other jurisdictions, how can you give us a reasonable assurance you know, that, that we are covered in most of these eventualities? Now, a couple of years ago, we had a couple of, of high-profile cases uh, um, that seemed to have seemed to have tapered off in more recent times. But the question also of uh, anonymous donors, uh, and I'd like you to maybe comment on that. Uh, we, we, we don't propose to, to go that route, uh, uh, but at the same time, I think it would be no harm to have your advice on the pros and the cons, the reasons for and against, as experienced from the experience in other jurisdictions. Yes, yeah, so I think in terms of the bill in its current form, um, I, I, I don't think that is an appropriate model for surrogacy, but as I said, if we look to other jurisdictions to amend um, the bill that is before us today, we can create a really coherent model of surrogacy. I think using the preconception approach would enhance the best interests of children in particular. Um, so again, I mentioned South Africa as a jurisdiction. There's a lot of case law in that country which I suppose, emphasizes the benefits of the preconception approach and focusing on how the best interests of the child can be prioritized in that way because there's certainty for everyone involved. And it means that when the child is born, their parents have full capacity to care for them from that moment. So I think the, the case law from that jurisdiction can be very useful in helping us to understand why that is a very good approach to take. Um, in terms of anonymous donation, um, the Children and Family Relationships Act makes it very clear that anonymous donations will not be allowed, so any donor gametes that are used have to be fully identifiable, and I think the same process will be used in cases of surrogacy. Um, I, again, from a children's rights perspective, believe that's really important, so that children have access to information about their backgrounds, access to be able to vindicate their right to identity, and so um, having identifiable information is really important to think from a legal perspective. And you remain... Yeah. Sorry, yeah. 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 You're going to add. I was just going to add in, though, I suppose, we, we, that, I suppose the Children and Family Relationships Act do, though, retrospectively allow for anonymous donation simply because it's the reality that that has happened. Mm -hmm. Like when, up to very recently, a lot of the donor sperm came to clinics that ha only had offered anonymous uh, gametes. So I suppose I think there is an element to consider then how do you legislate for the children that already exist regardless of how, whether they fit within the parameters that you want to have going forward. So I think you have to think about anonymous donation retrospectively, but prospectively then you can set out very clear protections around the child's right to identity. By not, protect, by not recognizing the, the parents of the child who already exists, it doesn't do the child really any favours in a sense, regardless of whether they know their donor or not. Do you know what I mean? That's a lay person's... Yeah. I, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of that situation. For instance, there are people in this country, there are, there are children in this country, that, 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 that are the, the product of anonymous donations. And uh, the question really arises then as to whether retrospective application in respect of the law can be applied uh, to cover all eventualities. And, you know, I'd like to maybe, if you might comment further on that, um, do you know, for example, the extent of, of, of the, the uh, children, uh, the products of anonymous donors uh, that are living in this country, in this jurisdiction now, having obviously uh, come to other jurisdictions previously? There are, there are quite a few. It's very hard to know because I suppose it's more obvious when it's, when it's same-sex couples, right? But I think the, 
the majority of fertility treatment or assisted human reproduction is, is accessed by opposite sex couples and I think that's a much more hidden um, area. So we, we just don't know the figure of donor conceived children who already exist who would be maybe the product of an anonymous donation. I know there's research in the UK that would say where it's an opposite sex couple, a heterosexual couple, they only read 2% of couples would tell their children of that donor, um, that they are donor conceived. So I think, but that is a reality, I suppose we have to deal with the reality that these children already are here. So I think what's, what's good is that the Children and Family Relationships Act is already enacted and that has a policy of, of recognising or having provisions around anonymous donations. So maybe that, that's an area that could be replicated, but just retrospectively. That makes sense. Uh, last question, Chairman. Uh, I, I, therefore, are you both satisfied uh, that the interest, that adequate protection exists for all the parties involved, the, the surrogate mother, uh, the, the the child, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, proposed parent or, or, or the, the new parents? That they can, that uh, given what we've seen so far, given the, the previous legislation that we, we've passed, and given the extent to which we have had submissions from various interest groups, are you, do you remain satisfied that all the interests of those three vital interests are, are being adequately uh, upheld? Um, well, in the proposed legislation, in the, uh, the AHR bill as it currently stands, I don't think that everyone's interests are pr adequately protected. However, if amendments were made to that, if we were to rethink the model of parentage that is proposed to focus on more of a, a preconception model, to include provisions to recognise cases of international surrogacy, and to include the retrospective provisions as well to recognise children who have already been born through surrogacy, then I think we can construct new legislation, a new bill um, that would adequately protect the rights of the child, the rights of the surrogate, and the rights of the intended parents. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Durkin, thank you very much. Uh, Senator Burke. Uh, the only issue that I have um, is, and I, I know you've gone through about looking at legislation in other countries, um, and in, in relation to legislation in other countries, what's your own view about where is it its best functioning and where, where is the best structure in place? I mean, have you identified which country and that we could, I suppose, learn lessons from? And the other, the other issue that I have then, you know, when you look at other countries, you look at legislation, but here in Ireland you also have to look at the constitutional issues. And I'm just wondering, are there any constitutional issues that we need to be um, concerned about and that we need to flag up at this stage so that it's not something that arises in five years' time? Uh, where someone suddenly decides to do a constitutional challenge. Um, and I'm just wondering if that has been looked at uh, from an overall view of, of the what is a very complex legal area because you have so many different parties involved and I think it's important that we get it right and we get it right. Um, I, I know in every piece of legislation you never can get it always 100% right but let's at least make every effort to do that. So my own academic research, as I mentioned, focuses on um, the South African law, or it entails a comparative analysis, but in terms of a very good model for regulating surrogacy, I believe that the South African model is a very good one. I should also say that South Africa, I suppose I chose that to look at as a jurisdiction in my research because the South African constitution um, very clearly protects children's rights and expressly does so much stronger than our own Article 42A, and it expressly protects the best interests of the child. And those have to be of paramount importance in every matter concerning the child. So as a result of their own constitutional provisions, their surrogacy legislation has been shaped in a way that really puts the rights of the children to the forefront. They adopt a preconception model, um, as I mentioned, and I think that the way that that legislation is structured provides a very good balance between the, the rights of all stakeholders, and in particular it secures the rights of children. Um, so that preconception approach I think would be again a, a good kind of blueprint for Ireland to follow and then also in the last hearing the model of New Hampshire was mentioned so that also takes a preconception judicial approach um, 
I'm not as familiar with that model, but it is, I suppose, along the same lines as the South African approach in that it is judicially authorised prior to conception. And so um, I believe that those, those are very good models to look at. Um, in terms of Irish constitutional issues to be aware of, again, I suppose we need to be cognizant of Article 42A and the rights of children, um, in particular ensuring that the rights of all children are respected and that there's no discrimination between children by virtue of the fact that they've been born through donor conception or surrogacy or through any other form of conception. So I think that's a very important point to bear in mind. But once our legislation is child-focused, I don't see any potential constitutional issues arising. No, I'm, I'm... Yep. Yep. Thank, you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, could I, before I bring in Senator Warfield, could I ask, um, is your advice for women who go abroad for assisted human reproduction, uh, either a married couple or a single mother, that they should opt for um, identified donor as opposed to anonymous donor? Is, is that, that, that's the advice. But there's no, there's no obligation at the moment for them to choose one or the other. Depending on what jurisdiction they go to, they may have the option of using anonymous or non-anonymous um, donors. I suppose, from, again, from a children's rights perspective, we would always say, encourage couples to use identifiable donors. But, you know, I suppose once they've left the jurisdiction, they, they have a different range of options available to them. And in relation to the proposed legislation, um, would that apply to... Uh, going abroad differently to having the conception here in Ireland? Yeah, so in terms of um, international surrogacy, um, it's not currently recognised in the AHR Bill as it currently stands, and we propose that it should be recognised. But in order for it to operate, I suppose whatever country the couple is travelling to would need to have perhaps a bilateral agreement with Ireland, or there would need to be equivalency between our laws to ensure that the identifiable gametes are, um, are used and to ensure that other you know, stipulations are met. So I think once that has been adhered to, it is possible to again construct um, a new provision or a new legislation that would accommodate international surrogacy and to ensure that what, whatever way parentage is allocated in the other country can then be recognised in Ireland, either before they leave or once they come back to the country. So would it be the case then that when the legislation is enacted, you then have to go through a process of bilateral agreements with other countries? Well, I think there's a number of options available. I mean, bilateral agreements is simply one option. Um, I think that would maybe streamline the process, ensuring that, you know, we could have a bilateral agreement with New Hampshire, stating that if any Irish couple was to travel to that jurisdiction to engage in surrogacy, then you know, provided that all of the kind of steps have been followed, we would then recognise the parentage when they return to Ireland. Um, it, it may also be able to possible to, to do this without a bilateral agreement, to simply say that once the couple returns to Ireland, they will be able to apply for a declaration of parentage, um, again recognising the two intended parents as the legal parents, provided that they are able to provide you know, documentation from a clinic stating that identifiable gametes have been used and that other criteria that the Irish state is happy with has been adhered to. So it doesn't necessarily have to be through a bilateral agreement, but that might streamline the process and make it um, a consistent uh, procedure in every case. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Warfield. Thanks, Chair. Uh, welcome to the committee and thanks for a very detailed and uh, comprehensive uh, submission. Just a carry on, I think, from Deputy Durkin's um, conversation. I mean, what I take from that is that obviously we have to proceed urgently to ensure um, that um, we have a framework that's fit for purpose and that we never encounter these problems again. Um, and then, while we might not have the answers in this room today, um, the reality of failing to retrospectively recognise some of the problems, the legal limbos that we see every day facing LGBT families. And Paula, you might begin maybe by, um, it, was, it was just mentioned in additional issues, I suppose, some broader issues. Can you explain how they intertwine with the um, Children and Family Relationships Act? Thank you, Yeah, I suppose I'll take you through really what we're proposing in terms of the, the families that aren't covered under the provisions in the Children and Family Relationship Act really fall under the first three recommendations we make in our submission. 
So that's where a child is conceived through non-clinical DAHR procedures should be in place to recognise a second parent as a legal parent. So that's one aspect. And then a retrospective application for a declaration of parentage, parentage in cases of DAHR under Section 20 of, of the CFR Act. We have spoken about this. We, we feel that should be possible where a known donor was used. Um, so that those families aren't left behind. And then to ensure that the second intended parent is recognised as a legal parent in cases where she provides an egg to enable the conception of the child. So that's a reciprocal IVF is, is um, I suppose, a, a way of conceiving that has emerged really quite recently. And it is where, I suppose, a female couple, one parent, donate, one of the couple donate an egg to the other so that they have a genetic link, I suppose, which is what we've, we've been calling for effectively. So what we're saying is just that this, this the AHR bill, could, an amendment could be added to the bill um, that could simply say unless, at the moment the CFR Act doesn't allow for that because the donor yeah. has to be non-identifiable, if you like, or traceable. Oh, yeah. Anyway, this, the wording doesn't allow for it. So we're suggesting just a small amendment saying unless the donor of the gamete or embryo is the spouse of a partner or, or cohabitant of the mother. So that would be similar in other jurisdictions that they've allowed for that because they understand that reciprocal IVF is a, is a reality for people and that, that it shouldn't bar people from donating, if you like, to, in, a, in a female couple, if that makes sense. So they're the kind of three. And then the other one is, is around the government should consider possibilities of recognising DAHR conducted abroad after parts two and three of the Children and Family Relations Act are commenced. So again, similar to what Lydia spoke about, looking at areas who have good practice, where couples are going to go, you know, it, it, it is a very costly procedure, the technology isn't as advanced in Ireland or the services aren't as advanced, so people will access services abroad. Mm -hmm. So we need to, they will continue to do that. So we would propose legislating around that. Okay. Um, Lydia, I might, might ask you just on, again on the final page, um, um, you say that um, the model of parentage that's proposed in the bill where the surrogate is recognised as the, as the legal mother uh, until birth uh, and that parentage is then transferred. Um, why do you think the state has chosen to include those restrictions? Is it legally possible to, um, to do anything else um, in law than than to, than to what, what's currently in the bill? Yeah, so I, th I think that that approach was chosen. Um, it's very similar to what is currently in place in the UK, and so I think that we have simply looked across the, the pond and, and copied their legislation. Um, in the UK, so they have this post-birth model where the surrogate is recognised as the legal mother once the child is born, and then parentage is transferred later. Um, so it's, you know, the, the timelines that are in our proposed uh, bill are the, exactly the same as in the UK legislation and so I do think that it was copied from that. Um, I don't think that it's an adequate approach because as we said it means that at the time when the child is born they won't have a legal relationship with the second intending parent, um, the one who is not genetically related to them. So it leaves them in quite a vulnerable position. It means that in the first few weeks of the child's life, you're going to court to establish your parentage as opposed to simply caring for your child as you should be able to do so. Um, so we recommend a preconception approach. So that would be where you would go to court um, prior to the conception of the child ever taking place and the court order would then authorise your surrogacy, first of all, to make sure that you know, all of the different criteria have been met, and also it would allocate parentage at that stage. So that allows for certainty, so you know, as soon as a child is born, both of the intended parents are recognised as legal parents, the surrogate mother is not recognised as a legal parent, and there's no need then to go back to court after the birth of the child to establish who the parents are. So it's at the time of birth? Yes, exactly. And actually, it just crossed my mind when Deputy Murphy was asking about um, change of minds. I think in the last in the last session that we had on pre-legislative scrutiny on this, um, we were informed. I can't remember by who, but it would be in the transcript uh, that one per one percent of surrogate mothers changed their mind. Um, what happens in that case? 
So it, it's very unusual that a surrogate uh, would change their mind. Um, I suppose that looking at the UK case law, I suppose again, if the issue was to go to court, the best interest of the child will be paramount. So I should say, so again, if we look at the UK approach, which is the post-birth model, meaning that the surrogate at birth is recognised as the legal mother, in the very few cases where those cases have gone to court and there's been a dispute, the it doesn't necessarily mean that the surrogate is allowed to keep the child or that the care of the child will not still be transferred. So in, in I think at least two of the three cases that I'm aware of where an issue has arisen such as this, care of the child has still been transferred to the intended parents, but the UK does operate a very strict model whereby parentage can't be transferred without the surrogate's consent. So she has remained as the legal mother, but the courts have recognised that it's not in the best interest of the child for her to keep the child, and so pa the care of the child has been transferred. So there, there in, in some jurisdictions there is a court process to address that. Um, in other jurisdictions there isn't. It's all based on preconception intent. So I think that would be a question for the legislature as to whether you wanted to have, as kind of was discussed earlier, this kind of emergency provision for a surrogate who changes their mind. I suppose on reflection, that might go against the ethos of the our proposed legislation in terms of it being a preconception approach because one of the advantages of a preconception approach is the certainty that attaches to it for all of the parties involved. So if there was the opportunity for a surrogate to bring a case after the birth of the child, you're negating that element of certainty. But I suppose that would be a question for the legislature to determine whether you wanted to have you know, a, a court provision afterwards. And I just have one final thing, Chair. Um, there are two more, well they might not be minor to some people, but um, the bill requires counselling um, that intending parents wishing to undergo AHR will be provided with uh, counselling. Um, we had a long conversation, well, some conversation about that last on the last day, um, but if you had anything to say about that, I don't think it was included in your uh, submission. And also on the age limits, a person would have to be 21 um, or uh, not over the age of 47. I don't think we have any, any comments on, on those points. Okay, thanks. Cheers. Thank you, Senator. Um, Deputy O'Reilly. Yeah, I just have one very small question, um, was possibly a huge issue. That the, when you refer to the, uh, the emergency provision for a surrogate, and, and, and the reason I ask this is I, I fully accept that it is a unlikely, um, if not you know, barely likely at all, uh, that this would happen. But nobody wants to sit in here and, and discuss legislation. It's just not going to work. So we, are, we want to try and get it right if we can. So when you talk about the emergency provision for a surrogate uh, who may change her mind, would that, would, that would involve a legal case, presumably. That would involve, uh, it, you know, is that there's... Again, when we talk about models of best practice and, and where you know, maybe someone's getting it right that we can look at that, it's a good idea. Um, I'm just wondering, are there areas where, however unlikely it is, it may be necessary that we would, would legislate for it? Because there are people, um, and if this goes, I'm not one of them, but that makes no difference. There are people who believe that this is a very important, um, and perhaps you believe it's more important than it is, but it doesn't matter, it still needs to be legislated for. So are there models of best practice? In, like, see, I, I don't like the sound of a thing that's an emergency provision, because that sounds like everybody just jumping into a car and running down to the High Court and, and all of that kind of stuff. I, I'm, I'm not sure, is there a... Is there, a, 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 is there an area that we could look at where they have done this and they've done it well and, and it has worked, that we might be able to... Um, yeah, so in, in the South African legislation, there is a provision that allows for a gestational surrogate, so in the situation where she would provide her own, um, her own eggs to um, enable the conception, she has the right to change her mind or to petition a court within 60 days of the birth of the child. So we, in the, the current legislation, don't propose to allow for that type of surrogacy, where the surrogate is also the genetic mother, but in that legislation she can petition the court. So I think that having that uh, so it's petition available, but also having a timeline on it, um, you know, makes it, you know, it, it allows for that certainty that I was talking about, and it makes sure that the intended parents aren't, you know, worried that this application will be made later down the line, and also for the child, it ensures that they're fully legally integrated into their family. So that would be one example, yeah. yeah. 
in that scenario, uh, is there post, um, no, not post, pre-conception counselling available for uh, for the couple and for the for the surrogate? And is that mandated by law, or is it simply considered best practice, or is it, you know? I'm not actually fully sure on the counselling okay, point, um, so I'm afraid I can't answer yeah. that. No, no, that's fine, that's fine. I'm just wondering if we were to incorporate some form of counselling with that, yeah. with, you know, like they, that you could, you're, you're giving yourself the best chance of never having to exactly, use yeah. what, what is an emergency provision if you maybe have that uh, stacked in, but then you have to balance that on the other side with the fact that, you know, m most of us like pe people just go off and have babies they don't they don't go and guys yeah. they don't think about it um and perhaps they should but i mean it, it, it's a simple fact that very often they don't so i'm just wondering if the, if the one and the, if they put the two together um that would probably one seriously minimize the risk yeah. of the emergency provision being used but also ensure that all parties were well aware of the emergency provision that if they needed to so nobody could get to day 61 with saying look back and say well do you know what i i wasn't aware of that so there possibly is a role for counselling, although my initial reaction to that is, is, is I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily think it's a brilliant idea, but actually in, in that scenario where you are going to consider if we do um, extend the legislation to, to encompass that scenario, then obviously the, the counselling would make, would make a bit more sense in that context. Okay. And I think that counselling is important, but also independent legal advice for the surrogate will be very important. So then yes. she's aware of that legal petition which can be made and yeah. all of the obligations or you know, um, the consequences of her role as a surrogate within that. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Chair. That was my only question. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Deputy O'Reilly. Um, just a point then. If, if the surrogate mother during her pregnancy runs into difficulties, which means she can't have any for the children herself, would that create a, a precedent where she could uh, try to uh, have parentage applied to herself, having previously agreed not to do so because of that particular medical circumstance? I, I don't, I, I've never encountered a case like okay. that, so I, I don't know if I'm a really equipped to answer. So it's a the theoretical yeah. yes. possibility. Okay. I suppose it speaks of that provision, though, doesn't it, of 60 days, yeah. where yeah. there is some mechanism. But it, I suppose at the same time, although maybe she has this medical condition where she can't have another child, you know, I suppose based on the research that we have around surrogates, they don't typically see the child that they're caring for another person as their own. So I don't necessarily think that would mean she's more inclined to want to keep that child, because it, you know, it's, it's not her own genetic child at the end of the day. So. Um, that concludes our pre-legislative scrutiny on this bill. We, I think we've had four meetings, so the process is the committee will now pr produce a report which will be laid before the Houses of the Oireachtas and will inform uh, the drafters of the legislation, hopefully to take on board many of the recommendations that we have uh, heard during our four hearings. So thank you very much for coming in to the committee, Dr Lydia Bracken and Paula Fagan, for your expert evidence. So that concludes our meeting. Uh, we have done in this area because it is a very complex area and there's a lot of there's a lot of legal and constitutional issues. So I think we all very much appreciate the work that you have done in this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this uh, meeting is now adjourned until uh, uh, next Wednesday, the 6th of March. Is that agreed?